All right, well, we should stop pretty soon. Um, I'll first just make certain that everything I posted is clear. All right, we, we have we can get started. So I posted. Um, um, and this, uh, let me just share my screen. All right, so the uh, you can see everybody can see the screen. Good. Yes. All right, so uh, the, I posted finally an assignment. It just took me a while to get all this material set up. Um, and this is basically to do a relatively simple example on um, deep learning on using this uh, NIST handwriting data set. And we've given you the CoLab and we want you to um, change the CoLab to change the value of the epochs. Actually, I went through this last week and I, I actually changed the epochs from three to five last week. Um, so it should not be difficult to do that. I think I, I might have even changed the batch size. Those are reasonably clear how to change if you look at the, at the uh, CoLab. And I suggested that you read this introductory material, which was essentially all the material we did up through last week. The introduction to deep learning and optimization, which was the first week's lecture. <coughs> and this whole discussion of, um, of the, uh, of, um, of the uh, in, of, of the uh, there were slides about the collab and then there were four collab notebooks covering introduction to collab python and this application so you want to take the last one covering this application and uh, and modify it and see if you can how the results depend depend on the so called hyperparameters the batch size and and number of epochs are typical hyperparameters. In that they don't change, they don't change the structure of the model, but they do change the um, the, the results because they it, it's a, you know in the case of epochs, it just is running. You when we're doing this optimization, it's an iterative optimization. We keep making little steps and trying to improve, and we do that in units of an epoch, which runs through all the data. And um, if we run more epochs, we would expect to get better answers because we will just try it harder. However, it is possible for it to actually get worse because the um, it is not guaranteed. I mean, it's if the function is reasonably now, if your step size is small enough I, um, and the function is truly differentiable, then then the um, the gradient descent is guaranteed to decrease the loss function. 
because it's a direction which you're calculating the derivative and the change in the optima in the loss function is the derivative times the step size. And if the derivative is clearly negative, it should decrease. But if the step size is not, even if it seems to be very small, isn't small enough, then it will increase. And that, at least in complex examples, happens. But I not in and and in this example it probably happens a little. So, but in general the epochs, um, number of e, the increasing number of epochs would um, improve the optimization, whereas the batch size is the is likely to be the opposite, because the batch size is the number of um, images you're considering with well, the number of units of images you're considering together. And if you increase the batch size, then you are, you are only updating the weights after each batch. So if you, de you, if, you, if you make the batch size bigger, you're decreasing the number of updates for the, weight, for the weights. So you might expect the it, the uh, performance to be such that the uh, results get better as you increase the epochs and worse as you increase the batch size. And if you have an increased batch size, you almost certainly have to increase the number of epochs because it will not converge as well. Um, there is no strong theory for any of this because it's the Loss function is such a complicated function, you can't really predict what it's going to do. Um, I will come back to discuss that a bit later on. And then the other information I posted was on this website here, which has all the lectures uh, posted. And you can see, this is most of the material sitting here up to now, which is the introduction of a reasonably complete introduction to deep learning. And I have, we have three types of things. We have uh, collabs, slides, and YouTube recordings. And here we list the, the, uh, the, the slides corresponding to the, um, that thing we just did, the, the MNIST, the MNIST uh, uh, deep learning run. We have the four uh, notebooks, which I, I actually copied for the, to the assignment from here. Then we have the YouTube for this, and then we have five lectures, each of which have slides and YouTubes. And the YouTubes are sitting here. All right, so this will last us at least one more week to get through all of this. So, um, so that's sort of where we are. Is that is that overall information information uh, clear? All right, so why don't I then get started on? Actually, I, given what I just said, I can even look at this slide in the middle of the slide deck. <laughs> uh, I thought, well, loss functions are a function of all the variables that you're, you're varying, which can in, be quite a lot in some cases. In the, in the particular case of the MNIST, there's not so many. But um, loss functions are only really easy to understand when you have two variables, two parameters you're varying. Because if you have two parameters you're varying, loss functions are like hills. Because you have a z value, which is the value of the loss function, x and y are the um, values of the parameters. And so if you just plot a z versus, you just do a three dimensional plot of the landscape, that is the loss function. And so this is sort of, is, is sort of what's being shown here. And I forgot to add, I, I can, I need to, add, I will add to the slides uh, later on the link to, for this. I forgot to add it, it's on another slide. 
And you can see that this is a rather rugged structure. Um, here we have some hills, we have a deep valley here. That's what you're trying to find, the minimum of the loss function. And this is a rather jagged set of mountains here. And what you see here, also here and here, the so-called local minima. This, if you got stuck here, you would not get out of it very easily because in every direction, the loss increases because actually it is a minimum. It's just not the global minimum. So when you have a valley which is high, which is not the small, not the lowest valley in the mountain range, then you get that is called a local minima, and you wish to avoid getting stuck in local minima. And a lot of the technology used implicitly is to avoid local minima. The whole idea behind stochastic gradient descent is to choose your choose what the um, the data you're using to construct the derivatives randomly, so that you can jump out. You do not get stuck into a particular course and end up in these local minima. And stochastic gradient descent is significantly better than other methods. Now, there are yet different methods, which I actually, I used to use, um, which also avoid local minima. But um, you can see from this picture here, it's just full of local minima. And you would expect any function to be full of local minima. minima. So, and, but of course, it's only really an illustrative discussion because the, um, the real problem is in much higher dimensions. I mean, in the case of these, these um, um, networks that they minimize for high, high end image processing or speech processing, millions or hundreds of millions of parameters. Here we just have two. And of course, when you have lots of parameters, the situation can be very complicated because you have to go in, you have to wander around this high multi-dimensional space. And you are given information and the fun, because you're calculating the derivative with respect to each parameter. So it will go in the direction where the derivative of that parameter is most negative. The parameters which have the most negative derivatives will get changed. Okay. All right, so that was just an accident. I just happened to have that slide open. So I will just try to motivate what one does by going through um, some examples. Um, and uh, so this is one of the recorded lectures. So the, these are, I actually added one or two slides for today, a few slides for today, but uh, this is, this is a version of this, this slide deck is fully recorded, but hopefully my uh, cloud recording is working. So I will actually record these lectures. Um, so the purpose of these lectures was just to describe some examples I've done or some of the McGregor who's online and explain what it took to do deep learning for these examples. Um, so, and I said, these are all run on Google Colab. They're using Jupyter, which are variant of Python network. And they're typically using TensorFlow. Although PyTorch is equally good. And Keras is mentioned here, but as I point out, Keras is now part of TensorFlow, although the key features of Keras are, in the, uh, uh, Keras are in the, an important feature of the TensorFlow package. All right, so let's just start on the first problem. So this is one I'm doing with another graduate student. And it's the hardest problem I'm doing because it's not so obvious it's going to work. We will see. Um, we have worked on it for a year and have not solved it so far. And well, if you, I used to live in Southern California, so I'm quite familiar with, with earthquakes and tremors and things like that. And 
the key thing one wishes to do is to forecast future earthquakes. And people have been trying to do that probably for more thousands and or more years. I don't know when they first inhabited earthquake um, prone regions, but um, uh, they've been certainly been trying for a long time. And unlike most areas of science, this area of science has not made much progress. That is because there's not such an obvious correlation between earthquakes and other observations. And we have a good phenomenology of earthquakes. We know how often they occur, that they have a, an exponential dependence on the magnitude, where the magnitude is the log of the energy. And um, uh, And uh, we, what you think, and the, most of the data are these small magnitude earthquakes, 2.5 to 4 or something like that, but which do not cause any damage. You can see the huge difference in numbers. 900,000 earthquakes a year with magnitude 2.5 or less, 30,000 between 2.5 and 5.4, 500 greater than 5.5, 100 greater than 6, 20 greater than 7, and one every 5 to 10 years greater than 8. But the ones down here, this 100, 20, these are uh, maybe from the 500, the last few hundred are the ones you care about, because those are the ones that can create huge damage and loss of life. And the uh, purpose of this study is to try to see if there's some See, but my deep learning looks attractive for this problem. It looks for patterns and data. So we have lots of data. I point out here we have um, earthquake shops. We from 1990 we have um, 2.6 million uh, recorded values uh, across the world, and uh, we actually have data from, from earlier than that. 1950 we have good data. <coughs> so that roughly at least doubles the data sample. Um, and I should point out that if you look at the field of earthquakes, there are two things one does. One is forecast the currents of earthquakes, which is sometimes called earthquake science. And the other one is predict the damage if the earthquake occurs. That's sometimes called earthquake engineering. And earthquake engineering is challenging, but it's much easier than earthquake science. Because if you know that there is an earthquake rumbling around in your, uh, through, your, through the ground, you can calculate the response of buildings. That is a, a, a well-known key physics um, calculation. So it's sort of engineering because you, you just have to feed in the parameters of your building and now you know whether it will collapse or not. However, the forecasting of current is very hard because we have these um, uh, continental, sh continental blocks rubbing against each other. And um, an earthquake corresponds to the block slipping. Well, to decide whether two giant blocks of, um, of rock slip or not is not so easy because you don't actually know what those rocks are made of, what the, what the uh, blocks are made of, and you don't know actually what the friction law is between the blocks. And um, however, there is some, you could imagine that, and that's the hope of this project, that whatever that friction law is, it manifests itself in terms of other shocks. And if you observe the other shocks, you can use them to predict the big shocks. There's some famous stories that uh, people believe in water oozing out or dogs barking to be able to predict earthquakes. And if that was true, you could build a deep learning network to see if it worked, because you can, um, you can have as input your network, the, the incidence of the number of barks per, per day or something like that, except we don't, I don't have dog barking data.
And I meant to go into present mode. So. so this is a very important step, which you do in lots of data. Um, namely, you um, the data is events. The earthquake occurred at a particular time and space, but we've been in time and we've been in space. Namely, we accumulate all the data in a particular spatial region, in our case, uh, 11 kilometers on the side, and we accumulate in, in time. And one of the challenges of this particular problem is what time to use, because the, I pointed out, actually what we care about only occurs every year or so. Those are the giant earthquakes. And the data, well, we've gone down to daily data, but we don't think that's working properly. So we're going to probably stick with two weeks by accumulating the data in over two weeks. Um, and we do, we were on this particular slide, it's, we actually do an, a, a comparison with a theoretical earthquake model. And we got perfect, we could predict thread <coughs> simulated earthquakes perfectly. That's because the simulated earthquakes have some physics in them and the model is able to learn the physics. Um, but it's not so obvious if the real earthquakes have any learnable physics in them because you, they could be these, when you have these slippages, they can be very random. As is well known, they're called phase transitions and when you have water going in, I mean, water going to ice or ice going to water. The actual transition is very, uh, very um, dependent on small details where there are imperfections and things like that. So here's an example which shows that um, you need to look at um, multiple things to be able to make progress. The first progress, is, the first thing which is not obvious for the Earthquake problem is what type of network to look look at. Now we started off looking at image-based networks, and um, there was one called the convolutional LSTM, which uh, is a, not too difficult, but a reasonably sophisticated network which combines time-dependent and image-based systems, and it didn't give such good answers. It, it wasn't terrible. But that was our, but we've stopped doing that. And this is the architect, you feed the images in, you go through some pre-processing step, you apply it to this convolutional network and then you predict. And here are some answers which, um, there's some measure of goodness, which is difficult to decide which the right measure of goodness is. And we're not, we don't think these results are good enough. This is prediction of true versus prediction, true versus prediction. Uh, this is for various choices, the pure the convolutional LSTM and also uh, separating the convolutional part from the LSTM part. Now here's the one I'm working on at the moment, which is actually looking better. This just uses an LSTM. And I actually only ran this off a couple of days ago. And um, we can explain what's shown here. We have here, this is running over 10,000 days from 1990. Or somewhat more than 10,000. It says 10,382. And it, what's interesting about it is, this actually is an interesting feature of deep learning. The data is daily data but you can predict anything you want. And so it's actually predicting the number of the number of uh, the strength of the earthquakes in a four year period. So uh, if we come to uh, here, this one up here, this one up here is the, uh, here we have the days and this is the <coughs> predicted earthquake activity for the next four years. So you run the, that you take the data up to all the data up to a certain time value and you use that to predict the next four years. And so 
is actually not it's quite good. Notice the um, this is compared with the observed. The, the this here is a prediction, and the prediction the end values do not have data because the last four years we can predict it, but we don't have any data. These ones here, the when we are predicting here one day in advance, we have data except for the last day. And here we're doing predicting for the amount of earthquakes in two years, starting two years from now. So this is like the four year, it's delayed four years. So I haven't actually done an example like this before. These just, are, here we have um, 23 days, 46 days, three months, six months, one year. So these are just looking at very different time intervals. And so it's sort of interesting that the daily data can predict totally different things. And you can, in, in general, there is no, as long as you have learn, um, um, training data, label data so that you know the answer, it doesn't matter what you predict. You do not have to predict anything strongly connected with what you're um, used to train. So the prediction and the input data are quite distinct. Now here's the work I'm doing with Gregor on um, COVID. I should say that data takes a lot longer to run than this data, which is COVID data. Um, and here the, the data sh shown in the next few slides are um, uh, actually 314 counties, each of which has COVID infection data, case data and death data. Uh, and this was running till August 13th. And they are, they are also being learned on the terms of the properties of the counties. The counties have 12 so-called NIH covariates, which are meant to be measuring the health of each of those counties. And um, it takes only a few, up to 10 seconds per epoch with a GPU. Whereas the um, earthquake can take up to an hour per epoch. So these results, which are for 100 and 196 days are quite good. They're running through the middle of August. And here is the case data, here is the fatality data. And you should not pay any attention to the normalization, which is the sum of all the data, even though it's actually fitted individually to each county. Um, the, I pointed out that it's actually, this is another little thing you have to be careful of. When you're doing deep learning, you have to normalize everything um, to lie between, well, typically zero to one is considered okay, because deep learning can't cope with wide variations in magnitude because the uh, it has activation functions and activation functions um, operate on, th they consider the number one special because they, ha they have a special, if you choose a particular activation function, it will, it, it cares about magnitude. And it's believed that one of the reasons deep learning is so successful is it because it has such nonlinear functions in them. Well, because it has much better, it's much more robust than traditional um, mathematics, approximate, appro approximating ways in mathematics, which do not have such nonlinear behavior. Um, <clears throat> Well, here is uh, just more, this is a somewhat better fit actually when it uses a different technology called a transformer. And so you have to look at different, you have to not only look at your hyperparameters for a given um, uh, model, you have to choose different models. Actually, MNIST could also be fitted with a transformer. Transformer is the standard um, model used to um, do speech these days. There's a famous speech engine called BERT, which is a, based on the transformer architecture, which came out, I think in 2017 from a Google team. Here, here I, those were the sum data here are particular regions. 
And actually, you can see some issue here with the regions. The data is a bit wild. Um, here we have an obvious jump. Uh, this is New York City. Um, infections, deaths. Here's uh, Chicago, Cook County. Infections, deaths. And uh, pretty ragged. Now this data only runs through August. And here we have uh, Seattle, King County, and Los Angeles, which actually all have pretty different shapes. But you can again see um, here the orange is the real, sometimes the orange has uh, anomalous results. Uh, and actually I can show you just let me, um, Are there any questions up to that? Okay, I will let me before I continue, let me just uh, Did you have a question? Uh, I I, I do have a rough question. Yes. Uh, how parameter, how um, aspects like the introduction of a whole new parameter factors into, into how, the, uh, how, 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 how the neural network is working. For instance, uh, the data you are showing doesn't factor in maybe say the introduction of uh, a vaccine, for instance, and, and, and so, so. Obviously, if you, <coughs> for instance, this, um, this particular run has, uh, has a parameter called social, uh, uh, social distancing. So it has a measure of social distancing, probably coming from cell phone, cell phone data, you can try to measure. So uh, how, how people are moving around and whether they're, all at home and things. So there is some measure of, of the, what the um, population is doing. But uh, you're correct. This is purely phenomenological data. And so if you suddenly get some changes, which hopefully we'll have this year due to vaccinate, mass vaccination, um, it will just learn the results of that change and you could add a parameter called the fraction of population that was vaccinated. In fact, that would probably be a good thing to do because if you had, because if you had that on a county-wide basis, you can then see whether the whether the model was able to predict the county. Hopefully, will predict the counties with more vaccination will actually have lower lower uh, in fact, case and uh, fatality rates. So you, these are all, there are 12 um, so-called covariates, which are rather co they're complex uh, me medical measures, were, which were given to us by our friend uh, Pine from who's, uh, we used to be at Pittsburgh when he did this. And um, those data measure all sorts of status of health, the, uh, the, the ethnic population of the county, the age distribution of the county, things like that. In fact, I can show you what it has. Let me just see. Let's go back to sharing the scheme. But when we started this, we actually didn't have much of this data. So this data keeps getting added and then we change the model. Um, All right, so let's look at this data here. So this actually only finished five minutes before the class started. And it's the same, um, it is the uh, same problem, but running until January 26th of this year. 
and I have uh, this is what I've been doing with Gregor, but we only have, we haven't done any optimizations here. But actually, if you look at the case data, it's predicting quite nicely, and it's actually predicting what you're seeing. The number of cases is significantly decreasing, and the number of fatalities is not decreasing as fast, which is part because it's. Um, it's obviously a lagging, fatalities happen after the cases. Um, and if you, I can try to, let me just, this is all, there's 3,300 lines of Python. All right, here's the data for the covariates, age distribution, air pollution, Comorbidities, which I'm not certain what that is. Demographics, that's a measure of the ethnic situation. Disease spread, health disparities, hospital beds, because you might have more problems if you don't have enough hospitals. The amount of testing is done, a measure of mobility, the density of the county, social distancing data and transmissible case data. I actually don't know, this data was just given to us. And they're either static data or dynamic data. Some of the data like social distancing has to be dynamic. Other ones like age distribution are probably static. Anyway, those are the tw those are 12 um, things. And then if you look at this, um, where are we? If you look at this, it sort of gives you an illustration of a real problem. Sorry, I've missed the, uh, let me just find the right answer. Right page. I always find it hard to find out, maybe the Gregor has a better solution, where to, where to find things in the uh, Jupyter Notebook. All right, here we are. We've got the output here. Right, here's this output. If you look at actually, it's sort of interesting. If you look at um, here, I just printed out one uh, New York City. And this new model is fitting New York City quite well to, to the end of January. And um, so. The other thing I wanted to point out, so this is a typical loss function. It starts off at uh, up here on, in this particular case around between one and 0.1, and it's ended up at uh, mm -hmm. after convergence of 0.0. Uh, well, I know it's not quite this model. So this model is actually converged 0.3 knots, uh, 6.9. And so you have to, this has after 360 epochs. And if we only did say four epochs, which is what that MNIST problem did, we'd be way up here. So this problem definitely has to run for a lot of epochs. It's still, it makes, um, that's, uh, that's actually why I only just got it done. I, I was, I previously done 240, I was up here and it's made quite a bit of improvement going down to here. All right, so that's just, uh, I'm trying to give you a feeling for what it's like to do this in, 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 so what are we gonna do now? We're going to look at different hyperparameters and try to understand um, what's, I mean, this is sort of interesting. In the week, previous results, they actually reproduce the weekly variation quite well. If you look at the new data, the weekly distribution is done well for cases but for fatalities, this too, the model is getting too much weekly variation at the early times. It is possible that that is some aspect of the data that's important, which we'll have to look into. Um, so, All right, let's go back to the uh, slide deck if I can. This one. All right, so let's 
continue on this uh, discussion of what it took to do this. Well, well, we have to decide on the problem. So I, I would like you to do a problem this, this semester. And so you better decide on it and you better get data. So we were fortunate enough to get very good data um, from our friend Pine who I'd worked with for many years. And we published a paper together in 2013, which was quite a nice paper. Uh, not on this particular problem, on a different um, uh, health informatics problem. So then you have to then you have to um, maybe select the data like for earthquakes. I just changed the, uh, the approach by only taking the top most active cells, top ten percent. Um, I already stressed we do with earthquakes is particularly what the COVID data, an interval of one day seems clear. It's not that you don't have too much, too much data, only a bit over 320 uh, time values. And the data is given to you in daily values. In the case of earthquakes, it's not given to you with any, any time bending at all. It's just given to you. Every earthquake has a timestamp. So you have to put it into a time bin. And as I say, it's not so obvious what that is. And I also pointed out that the predictions can be pretty different from the inputs. Um, I actually, we were, I was talking to some people from industry who have billions of, of, time, of inputs, which correspond to sales of, a, of, of the sell uh, the, the events which correspond to the sales of a particular item in a particular store. And they're trying to use that to predict the future sales. So that's pretty interesting. Um, the other issue, and then you have to do quite a lot. I would say most of them, I mean, uh, most of our time is actually spent preparing the data. Now, preparing the data doesn't take a lot of computer time, but it takes a lot of person time. So, um, and it also has to be done differently for each uh, problem. I mean, the, the data preparation for each of the problems I've done has been pretty different. The COVID data and the earthquake data uh, start off in different forms and they have different issues attached to them. Um, the, the COVID data is, as you saw, there are some bad data in the COVID data, which we currently have not removed. Um, neither of our, in some sense, earthquake data, you might be missing earthquakes, but you don't know. So you, I mean, if there's no earthquakes in the time region, there's just no earthquakes, the answer is zero. Uh, for the case of, of um, you could imagine that in the COVID data, there's some missing data, although we have not currently seen missing data. I noticed the missing data. Oh, uh, what would you like to ask? Oh, yeah, I, I have a general question on, on data. So, I mean, given COVID data, uh, that was actually measured in real time. I have to wonder when it comes to your earthquake data, uh, did you get some of that from historic information? All got from the, it's all open data. The USGS has an uh -huh. accumulation of all the data since I think the, the good data is from 1950, but there has data before then as well. It's just, just openly available on a, on the USGS, United States Geological Survey's website. I see. Yeah, I, I, I guess that probably addresses. The We're question. finding somebody who's willing to give you interesting rich data is non-trivial. Yeah. You know, earthquakes have no, earthquakes is one of the advantages of earthquakes is nobody can solve the earthquake problem so far. So they're not, in giving it away, they're not giving away any secrets. Yeah. I'm wondering about splicing together data that's been collected in different ways, because I imagine like a hundred years ago, for instance, they may have 
be in some collection of some information uh, and, and ways Well, of obviously, if, uh, well, we start in 1950 and do not use the earlier data. Even 1950 is a bit suspicious because the number of earthquakes is less than in 1990 by about a factor of two. 1950 to 1980, it was either a quiet earthquake time or they didn't collect the data as diligently. I, my friend who was a, who spent, I have a friend who essentially spent his life looking at this problem. The radical earthquake simulation and predicting, um, and trying to do what uh, he calls pattern informatics, trying to predict uh, the answer from pa observed patterns. And um, anyway, he is using data from 1950. So I, 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 it's good to collaborate with the domain expert. They can tell you what's important and what's reliable. Because it's actually often extremely hard to get reliable data. Like most of my early career was spent doing particle physics experiments, such as at Fermilab in, in Chicago. That data is really complex, has got lots of machinations done on it to clean it up because it's a uh, you know, the Fermilab accelerator, in fact, all accelerators, including the Large Hadron Collider accelerator, which is highly active at CERN, they're huge apparatus. And that huge apparatus, not all parts of it work, and it's full of um, detection devices that have to be calibrated. In fact, that last experiment I did at Fermilab we had to restart the analysis because we found a calibration area error six months into the analysis. A student on the project had to delay their thesis because of that. Um, they're just, they're, those are, I mean, the experimental sciences are quite challenging. COVID data is sort of interesting. You can look at, of course, even if you look at COVID data, there are at least three different sources I look at, uh, the John Hopkins, uh, what's it called, the Worldometer, and the one organized by the Atlantic Magazine. Their values for the number of people being infected and dying are all different by a few percent, a non-trivial amount. Worldometer is the largest and the Atlantic um, COVID project is the smallest. And I do not, they do not comment on that <laughs> as far as I can see. I do not know what, I mean, they all have the same trends. So the, in analyzing them, you're not likely to get wrong answers, I would expect, but in detail, the data is different. So, but it's, it's actually, separate. if you ask me to predict, I would not have guessed that you'd be able to get like we have, we have daily data for 3,100 and whatever it is, 23 um, US counties. I wouldn't, and, and with no missing data, I would, that surprises me that we could do that. That's quite impressive that the collection mechanisms are so thorough that you can persuade 3,000. I actually don't even know what fraction of the counties that is. It's probably quite a large fraction. Uh, that you could do it as well. I would have, you know, if you'd asked me to guess uh, a year ago, I would have said that even the global, data, even the the countrywide data will be a bit erratic. And it is in some sense erratic because you had all those dips on the weekend. The number of people dying especially goes down on Sunday and Monday. But that's all a reporting issue. That they, that the, probably the deaths are recorded, but they, um, they, uh, they report it later. And the probably more serious problem is that some, co many COVID deaths, and at least outside the US, are not reported correctly. I think there are some countries whose, uh, whose record of COVID, COVID information is pretty suspect. Russia is one of them, in my opinion. Uh, they, they didn't look consistent. But, um, but that, of course, you see, for deep learning has one advantage. It doesn't matter quite so much because deep learning is trying to understand the data. 
So if the data has a problem, it will make a prediction that there's a problem, but it's a consistent problem. Like in the case of those dips on the weekend. So the dips are not real. They're not that people don't die on the weekend. It's really what it should be saying. It's not deaths, it's reported deaths. So the fact that they're reported later in a couple of days later, well, that's just life. And that's what, co that's what the model is learning. It's, it's learning the distribution of reported deaths. Whereas if we were using a more sophisticated theoretical approach, uh, we would rather do deaths, because deaths you might imagine making a theory for, uh, based on the, you know, the, the way the, way the uh, bacteria, the uh, virus hops around. So I had not actually seen that feature before. Most things I've done in the past were involving minimizing, uh, optimizing, I would have. I was making theoretical models, not not in, not empirical models like deep learning does. Okay, did that? That was a chat. Is that saying the same thing? All right. So uh, Paula comments that comorbidities are just existing health conditions. So that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I also had a, a question about the last slide. You were talking about bad data and you kind of answered, you know, part of it. When you say bad data, is it just the kind of bad data where if you were in an experimental situation, um, it would throw things off or is, is there bad data? That's uh, when, I was, when I did high energy physics experiments, we would remove that data because we would find a reason yeah. for deciding it was bad and removing it. Now, in the case of COVID, it's a little tricky because they there were some cases early on where they suddenly discovered 500 fatalities in nursing homes that they hadn't reported. And then they added a big jump all of a sudden. So the daily data wasn't, that, so the cumulative was actually correct, was corrected, but it got assigned to the wrong day. And that's actually serious because the time dependence is completely distorted. The issue of not reporting weekends is not so bad because that's a systematic effect. And if you think you could learn it from some weekends, it will then be valid for following weekends. But forgetting to count a particular data set, data source, and then adding it in, that's serious because that's there's no way the, uh, the model could predict that. And so what it means is, I mean, we have to remember why well, these are all you, these particular ones are using the mean the, the uh, least squares um, loss function. So they are all prediction of the uh, neural net minus the observed value or squared. And you sum that up. And the observed value is taken as the, for this case here, as the square root of the number of events. And the reason it's taken as the square root is that if you, if you observe n events in a perfect world, you have an intrinsic error of root n because that's a counting experiment it always has a root n error because that's the width of the Gaussian. So if, you, so if you take the square root, if you look at the mathematics, if you take the square root of a counting of, of an observation of a counting experiment, that's error one. So then it makes sense to add them together. Whereas this is another important issue because many people don't do this. If you look at, they use in what I would consider incorrect loss functions. Because if I sum the events or sum the square root of events, that makes quite a bit of difference. Because the errors are going to be the error. The error for if you sum the events, the larger the large event counts are enhanced because the error is even much bigger. So you're going to force a fit to the larger observations, and the fact in a way that's actually artificial because there is some intrinsic. You expect larger error of the the. Uh, Bigger events because the real, the, if you look at classic least squares, the formula for the loss function is value, uh, observed value minus prediction or squared over error squared. Whereas people in most deep learning never put the error squared term at the bottom. And the error squared term is bigger for big observations. That's natural. Of course, the sum. Well, a lot of data that's not relevant because then they're, they're not counting experiments and things like that. Um, 
But it does show that the results can be uh, quite, there's lots of intuition and experience that you have to put into this, both for the optimization, where I have very good experience because of what I've done for 50 years, or the, um, or the uh, particular domain, like um, you mentioned the comorbidities. So no, the comorbidities would be a useful thing to look at. That requires a, an expert in, 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 in public, public health. And in fact, that data came from NIH. So it was some NIH project to uh, specify, to characterize the situation. It was obviously had some general things like comorbidities, plus some specific things like social distancing, which were put in for this particular problem. And one thing we're gonna have to do after this is to look at the fit and see what the dependence of the fit was on these different um, so-called covariates. The, which of the covariates was important in determining the fit? Because that's what, that will be one of the deductions from this, this study. And that actually is not so, not so easy because deep learning doesn't make it so easy to, it's not so easy to unwrap the black box that is deep learning. As, as, as there are lots of comments about that in the literature, it's, it's just not easy. Okay, so. Thank you. Good, all right. All right, so we've just got halfway down to bad data. And I pointed out that it's much easier to, to cope with the bad data or missing data for the prediction. You just drop that term in the, because your loss functions are, is usually, for all this, these, uh, this type of problem, the loss function is, this, is the sum over predicted values of a loss function for each prediction. I mean, say in least squares, which is what we're using, is the sum over predicted values of observed minus predicted all squared over error squared, where the error, as I said, for most all deep learning is set equal to one. In fact, you can tell they expect it to be one because TensorFlow doesn't give you a way of putting it in as anything else. Pretty clumsy TensorFlow in that regard. All right, so then you just run the training, which I just showed you the results of our training. Um, now, one thing I know, if you looked at that plot of the loss, the loss was very smooth. This problem is highly, is a very nicely behaved problem. That loss function is gotten, obviously doesn't seem to have any serious problems. And for this particular type of, this, some of my problems like the earthquakes, I do see often losses diverge, uh, but for this, the COVID, I have not seen significant problem with losses diverging. It happens a little, but not much. And then actually something which, if you look at that Python notebook, probably half the notebook is visualization. Um, and then you have to visualize the predictions and decide on the, and look at the results. And I showed you our initial results and I pointed out the, there was a little, little too many fluctuations at small, smaller times for the for the death data, but we're not quite certain. I haven't had time to look at that. And then you need to look for better models. Well, that can take you an awful long time. Even that particular model for COVID was a recurrent neural net. And the, there's some well-known parameters you can look at, like the number of layers and this number of nodes in each layer. Um, I, one simple thing which I've already done is increase the number of epochs. I started off with, with 120, went to 240, and ended up with 360. I don't think it will improve very much over 360. I might still run it a bit more. Um, another thing which I mentioned I did for the earthquakes is choose a better data set. The, of the, for that original Southern California data set, I had 2,400 um, uh, cells, I mean, spatial regions, because that I had been in both space and time. I, and I and I already said I'm changing the date. I started off, actually, when I, we started off, we had yearly data. Um, 
Then we eventually, we went back to, down to quarterly and then we jumped down to days. I think we're going to go up to two week fortnights or, or four week intervals. Um, and uh, the other thing we did, which does make a big difference is we just, we're only looking at the um, cells which are interesting. So that in the COVID case, that would be looking at the counties which had the most, um, most infections and fatalities. And that actually might even be a good idea for the new COVID data to just restrict it to the top 30% of the counties or something like that, which you can easily do. So I say, um, uh, COVID, the COVID data I present there is already quite reasonable. Our previous results are reasonable. So there we're not doing anything drastic. We're just trying to look at the hyperparameters. With earthquakes, we're trying desperately. All right, so the next. Oh, I, got, I showed you this picture already. Um, so I, I just wanted to note the types of things you had to do for this notebook. Um, so the first step is what happens before the notebook is uh, gets to the notebook. And um, for earthquakes, that was the binning in, in, in days or, or, or years or what have you. That was all done in a separate program. Uh, for the COVID, it was just read directly from the, into um, into the notebook. So there was no pre notebook. Well, there was an enormous amount of pre notebook uh, massaging by the people gathering the data and certifying it. So that thing was done before it even reached uh, Indiana. Um, as to say, to get to have no missing data is a pretty, quite some miracle. Um, so then you have to um, input, you have to do some specialized notebook um, processing and um, generic, but specialized for the particular data sample. So if you look at my Python notebook, it starts off with some um, fiddling around, which is basically taking the different data, the different uh, data formats, which are different for COVID and earthquakes, because they're all going to run through the same. Um, TensorFlow. The TensorFlow package is, is common between all the problems I'm doing because it's uh, just manipulate. It's just a, a mechanism for running a particular set of networks. Uh, so I can run any network for any problem. So I, I, ha I have to get everything into a particular format. Um, and there is some specialized processing to get in the format. Then there's some generic processing then we do the training, followed by the predicting and then the visualization. So, well, I've already done the pre notebook, I've already commented on. Um, the next stage, the, the, the data is essentially always given as some, some, <coughs> some formatted files. There's one as a format called HDF, but the most common is called C, is, this, is the Excel spreadsheet format. And, uh, Python is particularly good at reading spreadsheets, so most of it is uh, done in that format. Um, so after you've uh, read the CSV, uh, you have to uh, process it into the particular array set up, which uh, they, they correspond to static data, dynamic data, and with these uh, properties, as well as the uh, things equivalent to the time series. And um, you also have to just set up some some pretty names so that um, <clears throat> when I do the plot of Cook Counter, it's called it's labeled Cook Counter. <coughs> so then we have these tasks come onto all data sets, and as I mentioned, one task which you always have to do. You have to take the input data and set it into the right. Um, form for your for your uh, deep learning. And so we want it to between zero and one. But I also pointed out for COVID, I took the square root. <coughs> well, actually, for another data set, I took the cube root. 
not the square root was I, I argued on error business, but you another reason to change the um, what your what, 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 the to, to 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 multiply the input by a function is in the case of these um, this um, deep learning, you're taking numbers between naught and one, passing them through a network and getting an answer. Well, it's plausible that if those numbers are more uniformly spread between naught and one, you'll get a better answer. So for example, if you have numbers between naught and one and you take their cube root, they're still between naught and one, but they're more spread out because the cube root uh, will take numbers near zero and move them to, to near a one. And again, if you took the cube, it would make, take numbers near one and put them near zero. So you want to try to make the data to give a to have a network which is as sensitive as possible. You want to massage that data and choose a magic function which best distributes the data between zero and one. You don't want all the data between naught and 0.01 and to have a few outliers in the raising from 0.01 to one because then the poor old neural net won't really be able to find a very good network because it's the dynamic range is too small. Um, for the case of, of these um, um, earthquake data, we tend to use sequences, windows of data, so we have to generate that. That's true for COVID and earthquake. And you also must generate predictions. For COVID, the predictions are just the values of the next uh, two weeks of time. I took it uh, at, uh, the next day and the next 14 days to, to do predictions. Um, and uh, you have to be a little careful because if you're predicting too far ahead, then towards the end of the data set, you, you can't do that. So you have to drop those from the loss function, which is done in a fancy computer fashion by setting those values to be NAN and testing on NAN. Um, there's also some fancy thing, which is not obviously necessary, but appears to, if you read the papers, they find it useful, and I found it useful, is so-called space and time encoding. And so these are um, just a series which just label space and time, so that the, the network can have a way of distinguishing different space-time points. And for example, that uh, COVID data, which had weekly structure, I fed in a weekly, I fed in an array, which was cosine of theta, sine of theta, where the value of theta took seven values in between naught and two pi over the weekly period. So it actually knows what a weekly variation looks like and can use that, uh, that sort of series as a sort of, um, source of a um, of way of generating a nice function that uh, looks, uh, looks um, will have a weekly structure. And then uh, one interesting thing, all these funny things of adding these positional encodings and temporal encodings, it doesn't affect the performance seemingly very much. Uh, well, the next stage is the actual heart of the stage, which is where your where people got famous. That's the actual training, PyTorch or TensorFlow. Um, I actually added a, I, I added quite a lot of capability there, such as a monitor that uh, looks at the, the backup, backs up the runs, because I say some of these things runs take a long time, and restores them if the optimizer. Uh, misbehaves. And there are lots, I say, there's uh, um, and I'm always restarting jobs because uh, CoLab is not necessarily uh, robust over long time periods, like a day. And so I just save the data every now and then and restart the fit because these training runs can always be restarted. Uh, for the COVID, which is only a few seconds per, per epoch, it's, um, 
so I should say 60 second for epoch, it's a lot less serious because those runs just take an hour or two. Um, and you can also explore various window sizes. And the final stage is actually where most of the code is, <coughs> which is the visualization. And to actually do the visualization efficiently is slightly non-trivial. Now that actually is a reasonable place to stop because the next step, next step is, is uh, the, my actual PhD field, particle physics, and looking for structure there. So I have a few slides on that as an example, but um, I don't think we can do it in the remaining few minutes. So why don't I ask if there are any further questions? No questions. So I hope I gave you a feeling for what it takes to do one of these uh, one of these fits. I say I would like you to be start looking already for a problem that you can do as the final project of the course. And I try to go through this now to give you a hint of what the the thought processes I went through with other people like Gregor to try to make a successful project. So I would not choose something like earthquakes, which is possibly impossible, but uh, there are quite a lot of data sets available. And um, actually the time series, there are both image data sets, which we can, I have access to and because um, we, for instance, I'm working with people in the United Kingdom on a, on a science, a set of science data sets like recognizing clouds and things like that, or recognizing noise in my in electron microscope data. So I have a whole set of scientific data sets, all, most of which are image based. I think I may have mentioned image. Images are very, very common in science. Telescopes give you images, microscopes give you images. Um, so they're not only common for cars and self-driving cars, they're very common in science. And so most of the large science experiments end up by taking images. So there's lots of nice uh, science image data available. And if that's that type of thing, you can want, but if you could start looking for the type of project that interests you, then we can try to find a good data set. Okay, I'll, I'll see you next week then. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.